In September of 2021, the SEBI allowed mutual fund companies to offer silver-based financial products. As a consequence, three fund houses, ICICI Prudential, Nippon India, and Aditya Birla Sun Life have launched silver ETFs and fund of fund schemes. In this video, we shall examine the investability of silver as we look at the various uses of silver, what drives its value, silver's performance over the year, how are these ETFs and fund of fund structured, and should one invest in silver? Let's begin. As a commodity, silver operates as a precious metal as well as an industrial metal. In fact, more than 50% of the demand for silver is industrial in nature, as we see more and more of it being used in our mobile phones, our laptops, in energy generation, space exploration, etc. For example, a report we recently read said that electric vehicles use twice the amount of silver as compared to a vehicle with an internal combustion engine. So in line with the growth in EVs, the global demand for silver in the automobile industry is forecasted to grow annually at about 22% over the next five years. In terms of its properties, silver has a very high thermal conductivity and its high reflective strength makes it an important ingredient in solar panels. And with India and many countries around the world ramping up their green energy initiatives, the demand for silver is expected to grow a lot more in these areas. Reusable rockets that can be used for private space travel and launching low Earth satellites is another area where silver is much in demand. The fact remains that unlike gold, a majority of the silver that is mined is consumed in the real world, which kind of throws in a bullish fundamental case for the use of silver in the future. The first driver that determines the price and demand for silver is the industrial output. And this does not come as a surprise with over 50% of silver going to industrial uses. In other words, as the manufacturing activity increases, the demand for silver and therefore the price for silver increases. In that context, one of the better trend indicators is the JP Morgan Global Manufacturing Purchasing Managers Index, which explains the periodic expansion or contraction in manufacturing. The second driver of silver's price is the economic outlook. And much like gold, the demand and price of silver tends to increase when the future is uncertain. The third driver is inflation and silver's price has shown an upward trend when there is an increase in inflation. Now, other than these factors, the price of silver also depends on the supply of silver, which requires investors to understand its inventory levels and the capital expenditure outlays for mining of silver. Now, if the last three years were proof, the present demand for silver exceeds the supply of silver by a big margin, which can play a big hand in upping the shiny metals value. In the last 25 years, the value of silver has seen everything. It saw a period of lifeless stability for almost a decade, which was then followed by a six-year period of screaming acceleration when the price rose by 600%, and then a declining phase that lasted a whole decade when the prices of silver dropped by almost two-thirds. So 0% in phase one, plus 600% in phase two, and negative 60% in phase three. Now, given this volatile course that silver has partaken, understanding returns is also a function of time. For instance, while silver has delivered an annual return of 11.5% in the last five years, its performance takes a serious dent when we measure it over the last 10 years, where it has delivered an unflattering annual return of just 1.9%. So historically, judging the performance of silver truly depends on your chosen time period, which also seems to suggest that silver can be a tactical bet if you know how to play it properly. Silver is generally seen as gold's sister metal, and although it is not as valuable and not nearly as ubiquitous in terms of demand, it doesn't mean that it can't stand its own ground. For instance, it is silver that is more correlated to the global economy, with a larger portion of it being used in heavy industry and high technology. 
This makes silver a lot more sensitive to economic changes as compared to gold, which has limited uses beyond jewelry and as an investment vehicle. So when an economy takes off, it's silver that rises more, like what happened between May of 2020 and 2021, when the price of silver jumped by 70% against gold, which grew by only 6%. Another key area of difference between the two metals is on account of its volatility. You see, the price of silver is far more volatile than gold because of its small market, lower market liquidity, and demand fluctuations which coincide with the industrial output. In that perspective, silver performs well in selective pockets in spite of being an inconsistent performer, which makes catching the right entry and exit price a very important part of investing in silver. A third difference of note between gold and silver is their utility as a portfolio diversifier. This is one area where gold beats silver as the yellow metal shows a higher divergence to equities while silver continues to have a weak yet positive correlation to the stock markets. In numbers, while the correlation between gold and the nifty is minus 23, the correlation between silver and the nifty is positive 3, which makes gold a more powerful diversifier. A final area I'd like to talk about is the gold-silver ratio, which is calculated by dividing the current price of gold by the current price of silver. For example, at the time of recording this video, the price of 1 gram of gold was 4,964 rupees, while 1 gram of silver was at 61 rupees. So 4,964 divided by 61 gets us a gold-silver ratio of 81. It's a ratio that is quite popular with precious metal traders who often use it to take a long position in one metal and a short position in the other. So while this ratio is high, like what we saw in March of 2020, it's a signal for the traders that the price of gold is likely to drop as compared to the price of silver. This is when the trader may decide to buy silver and take a short position in gold. Now historically, this ratio's long-term average has been around the 60 mark. So when this ratio gets higher than 60, as is the case now, it indicates that silver is undervalued and probably gold is overvalued. As a matter of fact, we can pinpoint the peaks when the gold-silver ratio was at its highest, and coincidentally, each of these peaks would correspond to an economic recession. Of course, I have to point out that this relative price of gold and silver is not enough to take a call on investing in these metals. And that is especially true for silver because the demand for it is based not just as a store of value, as is the case in gold, but there are real-world industrial applications of silver which also play their part in determining the price of the metal. Nevertheless, the gold-silver ratio is something that people do watch out for, and an understanding of this is never a bad thing. Asset management companies offer silver financial products via two modes, the ETF mode and the ETF fund of funds mode. So in essence, the ETF is the primary product which can be bought with a DMAT account. But if you don't have a DMAT account, then one can buy a fund of fund which is nothing but an ETF that is wrapped around a fund. So what is a silver ETF? Very simply, it's an ETF that tracks the price of silver by actually holding the commodity in its physical form. Now the price that these silver ETFs track are the domestic price of silver which is based on the LBMA silver daily spot fixing price. Now we won't get into the specifics of this but very quickly LBMA stands for the London Bullion Market Association and it provides an internationally recognized benchmark price for silver. This LBMA silver daily spot price is what all three silver ETFs that is the one by ICS Prudential, Aditya Birla Sun Life, and Nippon India use as their benchmark index. In addition to price movements, ETFs and fund of funds also charge an expense ratio. While this expense ratio is unclear due to the recent launch of these products, we think this is likely to be in the 0.5% to 0.6% range. Investing in silver can be done in the physical or financial mode. In this section, we shall look at some advantages and limitations that the financial buying of silver entails. Firstly, one does not need to worry about the purity of silver, and that's because unlike buying silver from a shop, 
The fund house buys the purest quality of the metal and also ensures its proper storage. Additionally, the fund also ensures that the silver is completely safe and secure with all necessary insurances against fire, theft and other calamities taken care of. Also, silver in the financial form can be bought in smaller quantities with a minimum contribution of as low as 100 rupees. Silver bought through ETFs and fund of funds does not attract any wealth tax. A DMAT account is not needed if you're buying it in the FOF mode. And there is a lot more liquidity when silver is transacted in the financial mode. But having said this, the financial trade of silver does have a couple of limitations. The first concern is on the liquidity front. Now liquidity simply refers to the convenience with which one can buy or sell an investment as and when one wants to. Since silver ETFs are a new product in India, it's quite possible that it may take some time for awareness to be built up and for people to invest in them. In that case, liquidity will be low in the near term and a consequence of that is that one might not be able to sell their units at times or might have to sell their holdings at a discount until the liquidity improves. A second challenge that silver ETFs and fund of funds need to persist with is the tracking error. The tracking error explains the difference in the performance of the ETF compared to the benchmark it tracks. These errors arise due to delays in the sale or purchase of silver, expenses, cash holdings in the schemes, etc. and can be quite a big number if not managed well. There will always be some tracking error, but as a rule, it's always preferable to go with instruments that come with a low tracking error. The purchase of an ETF requires the use of a DMAT and trading account. So if you have one, that is something that one can explore. Investors who do not have a DMAT account can purchase units via the ETF fund of fund schemes, which can be conveniently purchased on the ETMoney app. Now there are two considerations that one needs to be mindful of when deciding to invest via either of these two modes. The first one is the expense ratio and ETFs almost always have a lower expense ratio as compared to FOFs. But since silver is a fairly new category, we presently don't have information on the chart structure for ETFs and FOFs. But as we learn more about it, we'll be sure to update you all in the description section of this video. This then brings us to the second consideration and that is liquidity. We established earlier that silver ETFs might initially struggle with poor trading volumes, which can further hinder an investor's ability to enter or exit at a desired price. And in that context, opting for the FOF mode offers a way out of this problem as units can be purchased and sold directly with the fund house. In fact, an article we read suggested that users should start out with an FOF structure and once the liquidity levels and tracking errors are stabilized, then investors can evaluate moving into an ETF structure. Any gains made from silver ETFs and fund of funds will be treated as short term if these are sold within three years of purchase. These short term gains will be added to your income and therefore these will be taxed as per your income tax lab rate. Post three years, gains made from these instruments are treated as long term and are taxed at 20% plus indexation benefits, which means your net tax will be a lot lower than 20%. If you want a refresher on capital gain taxes across different categories like equities, debt, real estate, shares, international funds, gold, silver, etc., then do watch our video on this topic for greater details. All said and done, the real question we are trying to answer here is, why should one invest in silver? Is silver a useful metal? Yes, it is. Is the demand for silver going up? Yes, demand is up and we presented some data on this. Has silver performed well in the past? Well, yes and no. And that's maybe why many financial planners call it more as a tactical bet. Is silver good for diversifying your portfolio? Well, maybe, but it is not as good a diversifier as gold. And finally, are silver prices trending up? That's honestly anyone's guess, but hopefully we have been able to give you enough information in this video to make an assessment or at least understand where to look for answers. And with this, we come to the end of this video. 
If you learned something new today, then do tap on that like button and do consider subscribing to our channel. Do share this video with your friends and I look forward to catching up with you next week with another insightful video. Until then. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme related documents carefully.